Okay, Rick MacArthur with Harper's Magazine. Thanks for joining us. Okay. I appreciate your uh, your tuning in today here at Gold Local. We're in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center here in Providence, but we're uh, glad to have you be able to Skype in. Again, Rick MacArthur with Harper's Magazine, president and publisher since 1983. Yes. <laughs> Since 1983, I wanted to just ask you about Harper's, ask you about the Harper's model. As we're here in 2017, we're all digital, we're all local. You're wedded to the magazine and again, have that paywall, if you will, if you got to pay $49.95 to get 165 years uh, worth of uh, Harper's content. Are you committed to maintaining this model? Is this, uh, is this going to be uh, doable moving forward? Yes, I don't see any alternative. I, I see the digital model as it's the god that failed. It, the, the best example being The Guardian, which is an excellent newspaper and is losing vast amounts of money uh, and now is begging for contributions. If we can't persuade people that writing has enough value to pay for it, none of us has any future. And no writers have any future. Writers have to make a living. Publishers have to be paid in order to pay writers. Uh, it just can't work uh, with advertising having all gone to Google and, and Facebook. Uh, one thing that could happen, which I'm not counting on, is that the government will take antitrust action against Google and Facebook. But <laughs> Obama, wasn't good. Obama wouldn't do it, and, and Trump doesn't seem to be <laughs> focused enough to do anything serious. So. That, that has been a big question amongst the media types. I mean, they're just, you know, they do, do, would you say they have the monopoly? As you said, you don't anticipate anyone taking that sort of antitrust action, but do they in fact have a monopoly in the delivery of, of digital content to, uh, to readers? Well, Google does. I mean, you can try to live without Google, uh, uh, but it's almost impossible. I mean, if you want to be read, even with a paywall, you need to use, you have to be distributed by Google. Uh, I have toyed with the idea of taking Harper's completely offline, but I think that would make us a, uh, a complete outlier. There's a couple of newspapers in, and magazines in France that have done this successfully. Um, uh, the Canal Enchaîné, which is a weekly satirical magazine, you go to their website, they say, sorry, we don't put anything up, uh, and if you want to read us, you have to go buy it on the newsstand. And they're still making money, a lot of money, and there's still over a half a million circulation. Another one is called That Day Out. It's a big fat quarterly. Uh, you also cannot read that on the internet, and it's very profitable. They do, however, have a website where they promote the magazine. We put Harper's up uh, every month. You can read it on the screen if you want to, uh, but you have to pay for it. But you have to pay for it. Uh, do yeah. you have a? You do have the a weekly newsletter component. Don't, uh, there's an, an additional. Yeah. Uh, there's an additional offering. Explain that a little bit, Rick. Well, the week the weekly review is a very popular feature we put out for free that we do we do not charge for, which is just a summary of the week's news. But it's a a highly colored satirical, slightly satirical summary. Uh, written by different staff writers uh, from week to week. It's become hugely successful. I think we've got about 60 or 70,000 subscribers, but they're not paying for it. But it, it brings attention to the magazine. It's, it's got the same irreverent and fun uh, skeptical spirit as the magazine itself. Uh, and a lot of people end up subscribing to Harper's Magazine, the real Harper's Magazine, uh, once they get used, they get addicted to the to the weekly review. Uh, but we're trying to sell a historical a sense of historical continuity. In other words, we're constantly mining our archive and finding relevant pieces from the 19th century, from the early part of the 20th century, mid 20th century, that are so relevant, so pertinent to what's going on today. Uh, I mean, one one piece that keeps it's a greatest hit is. Uh, Who Goes Fascist by Dorothy Thompson. I think we published it in the 30s. Uh, and it, it's about, you know, it's at the time when a lot of um, uh, uh, countries were going fascist. And so in the light of Trump being elected, it, it's become a very popular, a very popular uh, uh, article online. 
uh, you know, uh, the, the adage of history repeating itself does ring true, Rick. And you know, you do mention you know sticking to your guns in this model. But let's talk a little bit about other publications and maybe what you see. And I know you've talked in the press before about, you know, have people been conditioned, you know, Harper's aside, to believe that on t- online content should be free? You know, is there any success in reconditioning them to say, no, it's actually not? Uh, Mike Sheen with the Boston Globe, who's actually on the Go Local board, uh, did just talk with us recently about, he said the future of the Globe is the paywall, and they're trying to, again, build that up there. Is that what we're seeing now is sort of publications, journalists, again, making the case that, again, nothing's free? Yes, and uh, and writers uh, writing is work and should be compensated. It's hard. I'm a writer, and it's hard work. And uh, uh, if we don't, again, my my bet noir is Alan Rusbridger of the Guardian. He did more damage to the writing and journalism craft than anybody else by putting out a very good newspaper for free entirely for free and it became a kind of ideology you know this whole information wants to be free to which i used to say so does food but farmers aren't nearly as stupid as most publishers and so uh but the problem is now most uh, a vast number of readers have become addicted to the idea that information should be free including long well thought out articles they don't want to pay for them anymore uh and this is a catastrophe, in my opinion. And so I'm glad to hear Sheehan has is, is come around. Most of my colleagues who used to ridicule me for, for criticizing the free content model are now trying to erect paywalls, but they're having a hard time because they trained the readers to think uh, their, their material should be free, and, and uh, it devalued it. It devalued it. The problem is, if we still had a lot of advertising and Google and Facebook hadn't eaten all the advertising, things would be different. But uh, until the government takes antitrust action against Google and Facebook, we have no choice uh, but to try to get the readers to carry the burden. And I'm sorry, dear readers, but uh, you'll be happier with us uh, and you'll be happier with journalism in general if writers can, can make a living. I mean, I'm on the board of the Authors Guild, and we publish statistics every year about the decline in uh, income for authors. It's something like half of what it was 10, 15 years ago on average. It's, uh, I think it's down to about an average of $15,000 a year. Uh, and it's just, you can't make a living. So, it's, it's, and, and that's going to inevitably lead to uh, the, the degradation of writing and, writing and reading. Uh, also, you don't have as many editors, so the more this much sloppier writing gets on the web, then goes into print, and people get used to reading sloppy writers writing. Their standards go down, and they don't expect they don't they don't know the difference. They they they, they, they unlearn the difference. So we see a Boston Globe, you know, making a, a you know some headway into the 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 paywall approach. But then you see a Providence Journal, a smaller publication, again, part of Gatehouse, but continues to struggle in that sense. Will only some survive? Will only you know, national, bigger publications be able to make the play for it? Or do you think smaller ones will be able to catch up? Or is there just a saturation point of what folks are willing to pay? Well, the Projo is different because it should be concentrating on local news and investing in covering local news. Instead, they just keep cutting back because uh, Gatehouse is an asset stripper. So they, they buy cheap, they cut costs, and then eventually they resell at a profit. Yep. And the only way they're able to resell is, uh, uh, resell a profit is, is, is if they keep cutting back staff, cutting expenses, and increasing profits. So they pool their copy desk. There's no copy desk in Providence anymore. It's somewhere in Texas. Yep. I wrote a column for the Projo for, I don't know, uh, 15 years, and I used to get the best editing. Uh, Bob Whitcomb, who was editor of the editorial page, was a brilliant editor, but he had a big staff, five or six editors. They ran art. They, they caught my mistakes. They edited my poor grammar. Uh, uh, they were ambitious, uh, and, and now uh, 
the, the guy who's, who's doing it is he's a nice guy and he's doing the best he can, but he doesn't have the resources. Same thing with the news operation. They should be covering uh, local news that that uh, the big, the, you know, bigger media can't afford or isn't interested in covering. People would pay for that, I think. Uh, but instead, most newspapers, their model is just to cut costs, cut costs, cut back reporters, and then resell uh, a carcass. Now, you know that Bob Wickham is a columnist here with us at Go Local. He comes in on right. Thursdays, comes into the studio with us here. With Gatehouse at the helm, does the journal survive? Uh, I don't know. I think somebody will buy it from Gatehouse eventually, I'm hoping. Uh, but I just don't know who it would be. The question is, can you find somebody with enough money to invest in it to rebuild it? Uh, there's a crisis in Chicago right now. They're, they're trying to take over the Chicago Tribune, which is not a great newspaper, is trying to take over the last uh, competitor for the Chicago Sun-Times, my old paper. I used to be a reporter in Chicago. And there's a, a movement to try to save the Sun-Times and find investors. But you need a lot of money and a lot of patience uh, to persuade readers to part with a few bucks a day or a few bucks a week. Uh, you got to you got to give them something they feel they can't get anywhere else. And the problem with the, the Internet, uh, uh, and it's a fantasy, is people have the illusion of being well informed. They're not well informed. <laughs> They're not getting the detailed reporting and context and, and depth that they used to get in a good in a really good local paper like the Providence Journal. And the Boston Globe is doing all right, but it's not what it was 10, 15, 20 years. No newspaper is. They just don't devote the resources that they used to devote. And uh, you see in a, a state like you know, a rural, a smaller state where there's no a big media center, you know, uh, in the Dakotas or Colorado, these, these states are practically uncovered. The state capitals are practically uncovered. There might be one reporter, the Associated Press reporter, covering an entire state legislature, where 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had five, six, seven uh, correspondents from different newspapers. So will we see, I mean, we're here in the studio, we're you know, very focused locally, clearly, with being Go Local. Are, are we going to be able to see sustainable local journalism moving forward? Uh, if readers are willing to pay for good journalism. Uh, but again, it's, it's chicken or egg. I mean, the, 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 the publishers, instead of stripping their assets and instead of uh, uh, promising free, free, free content uh, uh, to attract clicks, which don't make much money, by the way, they don't make any, they make hardly any money, uh, uh, they've got to, to say they've got to make the argument to the readers, spend a little time with this, pay a little bit of money for it, and there are rewards to be had from this. Uh, I also, uh, by the way, uh, I've been reading a lot of social science about paper versus screen reading. Now, like everyone else, I'm stuck on the screen all day. I'm staring at this damn thing uh, every day for hours. Uh, but some a very good uh, Norwegian social scientist named Ann Mangan has published uh, several papers where she compares the retention rate among high school students between paper and screen reading. I'm just talking about e-reader versus a paper, and she's finding uh, uh, clearly that the retention rate is higher on paper. Now, so there's something neurological going on uh, uh, about a higher retention rate on paper. Maybe you see the whole page and you absorb more, or maybe it's because there's no glow, there's no backlighting, but something huh. uh, is making it easier to read or easier to retain what you read on paper. Uh, same thing with handwriting. They're finding uh, that if you learn to form letters by hand, you become a better reader later than if you learn to form letters on a keyboard. Um, this research is, is in progress. There's more to be done, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking the future actually is on paper. Well, Rick MacArthur making the case at Harper's Magazine for the print publication, making sure that people know the value of good journalism and that they should, in fact, be paying. We very much appreciate having you be able to Skype in, Rick, today. We hope to talk with you soon and wish you all the best in New York.
Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thanks, Rick MacArthur. Publisher and